thank you all for being so patient with me. Uh, I'm really happy to be here with you. Um, I'm going to leave my PowerPoint in this way because I've noticed that sometimes it just stops. So rather than wasting your time, I will just leave it as is. Right. So um, I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about uh, what has been going on in Eswatini. And for that, of course, I need to, I'm, I'm going to assume that maybe some of you don't know where Eswatini is. So I've put up a little map here. Um, this is the continent, the African continent. And at the bottom, there is a small, tiny little dot. Uh, it used to be called uh, Swaziland. It is since 2018 called Eswatini. Um, about 1.2, 1.3 million inhabitants. So probably a, a smaller kind of city in many of your countries. Uh, I'm originally from Belgium, but I've lived in Swaziland and now Eswatini for the last 30 odd years. So I wanted to give you a bit of an introduction and context and then look at uh, issues of staff development. Um, pre-pandemic, during the pandemic, and post-pandemic, so to really see um, So I, I'm not sure where I got interrupted, but just let me just recap a little bit. So the major issue was staff development, which was during the pandemic was very difficult because we used to do as many uh, universities all around the world were used used to do um, do face to face uh, workshops and things like that. So that made it very difficult to uh, continue issues like that. And um, while everybody was trying to adapt teaching and learning practices as best as possible, also I think people didn't have the energy anymore to concentrate on staff development and uh, some. Uh, colleagues, especially in Southern Africa, have looked at that and you've got them on your screen. Um, another important part was the lack of infrastructure and finances, but also the digital divide, uh, divide and resource and skills limitations, which uh, hinder staff development. So um, I think when we look at staff development, we need to tackle it from uh, various uh, angles. And we need to ask ourselves whether there's need for reskilling or upskilling, or do we start from zero? We had, as I briefly mentioned, we had already started blended learning. So some of our staff were a little bit more comfortable than others with going online, but many were not. The questions also need to be what type of staff development is needed? Uh, when and how should we be training staff? And then um, it comes uh, with uh, issues of lifelong learning. Is staff in general ready to uh, go on a lifelong learning uh, journey? And I think in the co context where I am, that is definitely not the case. Uh, similarly, with personalized learning, I mean, people are often not even aware of uh, where they need to be learning more. And so that also goes hand in hand with uh, autonomous learning. So, so building resilience was one of the major things that we were thinking of together with uh, developing a learning culture that would really be geared towards lifelong learning, because as uh, I indicated at the beginning, things will keep on happening and we will need to be adapting constantly. That's what life is all about. So how did we do uh, staff development in the pre-pandemic uh, period? Mostly face-to-face -face meetings and workshops. Uh, in general, they would be one day, but if there is, if there was a larger budget, then we would perhaps have two to three days, sometimes even a, a whole week. Uh, those ones were very much instructor centered with very little flexibility. And I think one of the things that uh, online teaching and learning has shown us is that we need to be much more flexible than we are normally used to. So what happened during the pandemic at the beginning, we can qualify it as rather as staff support rather than staff development. Uh, for a very long time, I mean, I can remember about two or three months, there was extremely little communication between management and staff. That was very, very annoying. That was very worrying because people were just doing whatever they could on their own. 
Now, behind the scenes, there was some form of movement. We have a Center for Excellence in, Le in Learning and Teaching, CELT, and we have an Institute in of Distance Education, which is where I am based. We received uh, a request from our, our Vice Chancellor to prepare a training program, and um, uh, the Vice Chancellor indirectly asked selected staff members to collaborate. So we were assigned specific tasks to train teaching staff uh, in view of that abrupt but necessary transition to online learning. Um, how did we do that? Well, we thought that um, putting, because we couldn't physically meet, having two online courses followed with a series of webinars would be the best way to do it. Uh, the series of webinars now, uh, this is about a year and a half ago when we had the two online courses, the series of webinars are still ongoing. We are working a lot on authentic online assessment at the moment. And we also ensure that there is personal support from the IT and the instructional design staff so that people can uh, keep on learning. So um, just a, a few things about the two courses. Uh, the first one was very much uh, pedagogical in nature because we have noticed, and I think this is perhaps also something we find in many countries, um, that staff in higher education often have not been trained to teach at all. Well, that's definitely the case with us. So these are people with a master's degree, with a PhD degree, who uh, come out of their uh, master's or PhD training and who are put in front of a classroom and basically don't know what to do. So we thought that it was very important to focus on pedagogy and then bring in uh, the selected aspects of uh, ICT. So integrating it um, slowly but surely. We took an, a scaffolding approach, uh, which was basically socio-constructivist and connectivist in nature, with lots of opportunities for re reflection, but also collaboration and teamwork. Uh, we we're trying not to be prescriptive, um, starting really from an introductory level, giving basic information and opportunities to practice, but also a lot of food for thought. Again, with that idea of uh, getting people to be more autonomous, to be more um, self-reflecting uh, type of practitioners. So this is what the course looked like, uh, four different topics. That was the first course. The second one, um, I don't think I've got a slide on that, but the, the second one was much more hands-on. So basically what everything that had been learned in the first one was then going to be um, applied by specific lecturers for their own course in the Moodle environment. So this is what happened. Um, now, getting away from that, um, what should we be doing in future? And I'm going to give you an example of how we've started building towards that. So what do we need training on? A variety of things, digital pedagogies, but also issues of inclusive education and equity, uh, pedagogies of care. I think you know the previous uh, speaker also indicated uh, issues of stress uh, and how much it has an impact on our students, but also on ourselves. Uh, then, of course, artificial intelligence, virtual realities, and how these uh, can be incorporated, moving towards the Internet of Things, um, as much as possible going uh, to open education and ensuring that diversity is present. Uh, teachers, in my opinion, are intercultural um, agents. Uh, and need to be able to um, look at difference as a resource rather than an obstacle. Now, which skills do we need in the future? I think uh, many people have talked about 21st century skills, flexibility, adaptability, emotional intelligence, uh, but also skills of, for collaboration, for leadership, and for self-management and self-monitoring. And uh, a lot of colleagues in Southern Africa are working around self-directedness. Now, these resources, uh, especially in the context where we are, where um, neither the university uh, as a whole, nor the students, nor all the different stakeholders involve, involved have actually uh, enough or, or sufficient budgets to work with anything but 
open education resources. That doesn't mean that people trust them. That doesn't mean we need to still do a lot of work of sensitization, awareness raising, and also uh, making sure that we have quality open education resources. But that's one of the ways uh, we think we should be going. Then also open source technologies. So let me give you briefly an overview of what we've started doing. Um, it's called a Certificate in Online Teaching for Educators. We have now uh, invited uh, participants from outside the university to get uh, these basic uh, online teaching uh, skills. And we have developed four modules that work around the following course objectives, uh, design an online lesson and or course, create digital learning materials, teach and facilitate online and assess online. And um, of course, these objectives uh, we, we, we think, and that's how we designed it, will lead to a whole uh, array of key competencies and you've got them here. They really uh, a breakdown of the major objectives and then translated into what people will be able to do. Um, also to indicate that uh, this is a fully online course. Uh, we use the Moodle platform as our main platform, but we are complementing it uh, with interactions daily, uh, sometimes even hourly interactions on WhatsApp, because WhatsApp is one of the social media that is extremely much uh, used uh, in Eswatini, both for personal reasons, but also for professional and uh, learning reasons. Um, each module, so I've said four modules, uh, are facilitated by a five-person team, two facilitators, an e-tutor, a technologist, and a technician. We first were working only with one technologist, but very soon we noticed that the technician was also needed. Um, some of our participants were unable to... Um, to, 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 to save a document, a Word document as a PDF, for example. So we really had to uh, go back a notch and, and ensure that you know, some of these really basic things are uh, available and assistance is available. It's a six weeks course. Uh, we are advising our participants to set aside about two hours per day, seven working days, per module and we've made sure that there's always a weekend included so that um, if people um, want, they can take a little break, but many of them will have to catch up on what they uh, needed to do during the week because these are working professionals. And so we wanted to give them that weekend to uh, do so. Variety of online teaching and learning approaches, readings, lecture notes, screencasts, videos, mm -hmm. audios, uh, discussions in fora or in uh, chat rooms, and a lot of uh, both individual and group activities. We have included assignments in each and every module and active uh, participation in the various online activities is also part of this. At the end, people receive a certificate in online teaching for educators. Of course, uh, I'm, I'm getting to the end of my uh, short talk. Of course, we still have a lot of questions like we all do, you know, where are we? Is this already, um, does this have the impact that we need it to have? Uh, we've started doing some um, surveys to make sure that we can uh, keep up uh, with uh, quality, but also get, excuse me, sufficient data uh, to improve, to keep on improving on the course delivery. Uh, where do we want to go? So together with all those questions that uh, I, I, I talked about, uh, there are many possible solutions, but uh, all of them require uh, from all the stakeholders, cooperation, collaboration, and flexibil flexibility, and uh, enhanced networking. I think that's one of the, uh, the issues we also have uh, in, uh, in the region. Uh, and of course, there are many solutions, some more appropriate, appropriate some more uh, adequate for the context than others, but we are still looking into that as well. Um, in front of you, you have some of uh, the uh, sources I was using to put together the talk, and I've now come to the end. So I'm also, like, my, uh, like the previous speaker, of course, open to questions, to comments, and I want to thank you for, for listening to me and giving me the opportunity to speak to you. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you.